Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire Haley. I am the Director of Strategic Communications here for the History Center and the coordinator of these author talks. I am so, so excited to welcome you to tonight's event. So we are hosting uh, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray for their newest book, The Personal Librarian. It was actually just released yesterday. So if you don't have your copy yet, you can get it from tonight's official bookseller, Foxtail Books. And I will be posting a link to do that in the chat. They are a local independent bookstore located up in Woodstock. So if, again, if you don't have your copy, Amazon's great, but Foxtail is better. So I'll post that link for you. I'm gonna briefly introduce tonight's panelists and then turn it over to our moderator this evening. Marie Benedict is a lawyer with more than 10 years experience as a litigator. She's a graduate of Boston College and the Boston University School of Law and is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Only Woman in the Room, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie, Carnegie's Maid, The Other Einstein and Lady Clementine. All have been translated into multiple languages, and she's a repeat guest of Atlanta History Center, so we're so thrilled to have her back this evening virtually. She lives in Pittsburgh with her family. We are also joined by Victoria Christopher Murray. She's an acclaimed author with more than 1 million books in print. She has written more than 20 novels, including Stand Your Ground, an NAACP Image Award winner for Outstanding Fiction, and a Library Journal Best Book of the Year. She holds an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. Marie and Victoria will be in conversation with Christian Weatherspoon this evening. Christian is the Vice President of Digital Storytelling right here at Atlanta History Center. With nearly 10 years of digital journalism experience, she has worked with news, public policy, and government organizations to effectively deliver content to a variety of audiences across digital and social media platforms. Her passion for amplifying untold stories has taken her all over the Southeast. She has received awards from the Georgia Associated Press and the Atlanta Association of Black Journalists for her work. She received her master's degree in broadcast journalism from Northwestern University's renowned Metal School of Journalism and a bachelor of science from Jackson State University. We are so thrilled that everyone's able to join us virtually this evening. Now, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A feature to submit those throughout the event, and we'll get to as many as we can. So without further ado, Christian, Marie, Victoria, welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me back. I love coming to the Atlanta History Center. You guys are just tremendous in your mission and all the work that you do. And I'm just such a fan. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm absolutely over the moon um, to be here and stepping in and moderating and having a conversation with you both tonight. Um, so I know we talked a bit offline, but um, I do want you guys to run away. I'm, we're all eager to, to listen and learn tonight. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, you know, we know the book explores the life of J.P. Morgan's personal librarian, Bill DaCosta Green. Um, as I've explained to a friend as I was reading the book, she was truly in that time living her best life or, <laughs> or, or, the, or, the, uh, or the best life she could live within the confines yeah. of, um, of society. Um, but, you know, I just want to give you guys an opportunity to talk to me about kind of why this story of Bill DaCosta Green was such an interesting and, and really important story to tell. So I think Marie, you should start because this began with her in her head. Well, I mean, it began with Bill DaCosta Green. I think we can in all we can all agree on that. But I mean, she was such a phenomenal figure. Um, I but such an unknown figure, I think. And I think the the sort of mystery around her life, the secrets that she had to keep, and yet the renown that she was able to garner are so impressive and powerful. But I first came across her actually a long, long time ago. I was, um, as Claire said, I was a, an unhappy lawyer in New York City working at huge law firms. And um, I would scamper off um, when I couldn't take it anymore to the museums and libraries of the city. Um, I had always had a passion for history and untold stories. And, you know, I was off imagining my own best life somewhere else. And I happened to particularly love the Morgan Library, which if any anyone who's listening tonight has ever been there, you know, it's like the most gorgeous library you can imagine. You know, it was built by J.P. Morgan in, um, it was, it started in 1902, ended in 1906. It was really built to house his personal collection of rare and priceless manuscripts and Renaissance artwork. And it's just gorgeous. Victoria and I were just there yesterday. And I mean, it's so breathtaking. 
Um, and I have, I went to go there just to kind of escape from my life and envision a different one and a passing docent, pardon the pun, um, happened to mention Belle de Costa Green. You know, she let me know that um, she had served as JP Morgan's personal librarian and that she was beyond instrumental in helping create not only the beginnings of his collection and, and really building it up to be a world-class collection, but what happened to it after he passed away, you know, the way she really shepherded it to become, uh, you know, a public institution. I mean, all of their holdings were donated to the public and, and really a, a model for libraries across the world. Um, and I sort of, you know, I was fascinated with untold histories, especially women. And I kind of put her on my list and I would revisit her from time and time again. We were just talking about my list with my um, agent yesterday, Victoria and I were, and, um, and she would resurface, but I knew I needed and wanted to have um, uh, a partner to tell Belle's story. You know, Belle had a secret. She was um, a black woman passing as white. She lived in a society and in a time period that was deeply racist, highly segregated. You know, Jim Crow was the law of the land and she could not be her real self um, in the world and thrive. Um, and I knew that, um, Belle deserved to have a black writer, a black woman tell her story alongside, alongside me. Um, and, but it wasn't until I found Victoria that um, I felt like I could do it, you know, or that we could do it. Um, and um, I, I don't know, how much, how far should I go? I feel like I'm just talking and talking. Um, but I read a book that Claire mentioned, this phenomenal book Victoria um, wrote called Stand Your Ground, which looked at the shooting of a young black man from the perspective of his mother and the wife of the white police officer. And it was just so beautifully written, so nuanced, looking at these untold perspectives of such a charged, important issue. I just, I really hoped that she would be interested in writing the story with me. And I'll let her tell you what she did. <laughs> so when I did receive a proposal from my agent and all my agent said was, I want you to look at a collaboration idea. And I thought that was a good thing. I had written six books with another writer, Rashonda T. Billingsley. So I loved writing collaborations. I like that better than individual. You have a partner. Uh, but she's all my agent said was Marie Benedict. And when I looked Marie up, um, she wrote historical fiction of, of these wonderful women. I found that fascinating. But I wanted to know, what did that have to do with me? I write contemporary fiction. And then I called my agent because I still didn't understand what this was about. And I said, so has Marie like looked at me? Has she seen a picture of me? Is she talking about another Victoria Christopher Murray? Um, and so my agent said, yes, we know what we're doing. Just read it. And what was so bad, Christian, is that it took me so long to read it because the first paragraph said J.P. Morgan, who had this, and I was like, I couldn't get past J.P. Morgan. I didn't care. I just didn't care. And so a couple of weeks passed by and my agent would call and say, have you read it yet? And I was like, oh no, I'm really busy. And about two months later, she said, you know, you can't be that busy. It's two pages. It wasn't long. It wasn't long, but I couldn't read it because I didn't care about J.P. Morgan. So finally, one day I was with the other writer that I collaborate with, Rashonda, and we sat down, we forced ourselves because she didn't get it either. And when we got to the part that said, and no one knew that Belle de Costa Green was a black woman passing for white, I sat up in my chair. I couldn't call my agent fast enough. And I said, I'm in. I am in. I couldn't wait to do it. And I felt so bad that I had wasted all of that time. But I teased her. Marie all the time because I tell her she should have led with the last paragraph. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't. I guess I was like getting you were building it. You were it up. I learned a lesson that day because <laughs> we could have started on this two months before if I had if I had led with my with my my good stuff and my interesting when she, when she got to the story. cliffhanger, it was wonderful. Right. Yeah. Well, talk to me a little bit more about kind of what that writing process was. I mean, I can imagine it's difficult co-authoring a book in general, but especially, you know, when you when you guys write such different um, kinds of fiction, 
Um, kind of talk to me about what that experience was like and kind of what were some of the specific dynamics in putting this particular story together. So do you want to do that? You know, I had done collaborations before. And one of the things that I know is that I listen to other people do collaborations and they're not very happy, but I was thrilled with my partner. Rashonda and I had written six books together. So I was thrilled with it. And this is what I knew. I knew that you had to have a writing soulmate. Mm -hmm. And I knew you would have to like the person and trust them and believe in their gift. And I had, I was reading because my agent did send me Marie's book, The Other Einstein. So I was reading that. So I believed in her gift, knew she could write, knew I could write with her. And, and the first time we had a phone call, I knew I had yeah. no doubt we would be fine. The challenge was going to be, Marie had never done a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know how she would feel because you really do have to trust um, your co-writer because your co-writer is going to cross out some of your words. Mm -hmm. And so, or say, you should say something differently. So you've got to trust and believe. And so I didn't know how that would be for you, Marie. Well, I am. Um... I felt so fortunate, not just that Victoria finally agreed, although I will say during those two months, there were many times I was like, well, is it me? Is it the story? Is it, I mean, what is it? You know, she can't even tell me it's that bad. Like, I don't know. There were, there were, it was crisis of faith during that time period. But um, eventually when we did talk, um, I mean, I knew that Victoria had collaborated before, because of course I had researched her and you know, we just, it's hard to really explain, but we really clicked immediately, you know, the way there's, I mean, there's so many things about us that are so much the same. It's, it's, it's actually kind of crazy, but we, you know, obviously the elephant in the room, I don't know if you've noticed I'm white, but Victoria is black. There's obviously differences, but there are so many things that, that, that we just are so similar. Um, and I knew, as soon as I knew how much, how connected I feel to her, I knew I could just trust her to help, help me understand what a collaboration could look like. And she had done a variety of different collaborations with, with uh, Roshanda. And she had told me that a lot of the, how the collaboration works kind of depends not just on what you're writing, but on, you know, what p different people's strengths and weaknesses are, you know, and we just like Victoria and Roshanda have, uh, Victoria and I have very, it's almost, I always do this. I know I always do this when I talk about this, Victoria, but I, we have a, where my weaknesses are, Victoria has great strength and it's- And vice versa. And, it, and re it really works. Marie can lay down a foundation like no one I know. She can lay down a foundation of the story. Me getting the first draft out of me is like pulling teeth without medication. It is the worst thing in the world. And then pulling my tooth over and over, putting it back <laughs> in and pulling it out again. And then Marie is not, it's like, Rashonda, she's not crazy about, she's like, okay, it's written, go, go away. And then that's when I love to work with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so we had that, but we, what was so great about working with Marie was that she understood it right away, that we would have our own way of writing together. And so we discussed every chapter. Mm -hmm. um, some chapters she wrote first, some I wrote first, then we'd switch it and then fix it or write it. And Marie has this wonderful magic brush, I call it, because she knows how to speak the lyrical language of the 20th century or the 18th century, whatever she's writing. And I don't, I'm a contemporary writer. So I'll say in a minute, hey, dude, what's up? And then Marie will come after me and fix it. Oh. Yeah, it what was amazing is, you know, it, like you ask, like, how did it work? Well, it, it wasn't like it was a fixed formula. You know, certainly I, you know, I, Victoria's right. I love to do like the foundational work, the first track, the first draft. That's really I don't know. That's, that's, I, and the editing, which is like Victoria loves. I'm like, oh my God, I think I just can't even look at that anymore. <laughs> and she can take it and see something fresh and new and see the holes. And whereas I'm finished with it, I'm done with that. <laughs> um, so that worked out really well. But also, I think, um, you know, chapter by chapter, there would be differences, you know. So, for example, there might be one chapter that was very heavily historic. And, and that's my jam, you know. I, 
love the historical research. I love, and Victoria's become a champ at it, but I'm like a freak. You know what I mean? I love that stuff. And, you know, so I might, in my first draft, I might focus on that and she might take a, 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 a different section of it or, or vice versa, depending on, you know, where our interests are. Yeah. I mean, it just really, but the, the trick, I think, tell me if you agree with me, Victoria, what is that, is that we talked about it all. So we, we would take, you know, we would talk about the over arc, uh, uh, the arc of the story, but then as we're going through each of the beats, which is a Victoria a word, Victoria likes to use, which I love as we're going through each of the beats, we're like, okay, well, how's this going to work? And we would talk it all through and then kind of say, well, I really want to write that part or, or that, you know, that's like six pages of historical framework. I'll take it. Right. Cause I've got like six poems on my desk, you know, so it just kind of, it really did work out it well. Just worked. But we talked through one of the things I'm so proud of about this book is that we wrote every word together. Together. Yeah. And through, it was really, we were talking about this yesterday, I think, you know, I think it was in the conversations yeah. that the characters and the story actually came alive. Like, and sometimes it wasn't the first conversation. Sometimes we, we thought we had it and then we finished it. We'd be like, let's, what do, what do you think? Do you really think she would have said that? We'd be like, no, we had it wrong. And, yeah. and we'd go back to the drawing board and, and talk it out. And I'll uh, never forget at one point I was working on something. And so that gave Marie a chance to read a book, you know, doing more research because that that's her jam. I literally can't stop myself. That's a problem. And she, I'll never forget this because you got, you sent me a text saying, we, we have to talk quickly because um, normally we spend three hours a day on Zoom. Right. <laughs> and so really. During the pandemic, up. Zoom was like our BFF. Yeah. And then, so this is one of the only conversations we had on the phone when you were told, in, you told me about the book you read Mm. We changed an entire scene mm -hmm. um, and the book was done. We were in edits and mm -hmm. we changed an entire scene, which actually changed a lot of the other beats, you know, through the whole story based on something that uh, Marie read and she called me up and she said, let's talk about this. And she was so right. I love this whole process. I don't know if you could tell. But I just love it, it was amazing. But it was like it can't in the talking is where it came alive. Like the book you're talking about, I think, is the um the book about it's a historic book about passing. It's called A Chosen Exile by Allison Hobbs. And um we had I, I want to say it sounds like downtime, but it was, you know, it was not that much time. But we were we were, you know, our character, Belle de Costa Green, burned. We were talking about this a little bit before we went live. She burned everything she didn't want anyone to know that she she was a black woman because she thought given the time period it would affect her legacy which was the morgan library and it's in its its position in the world and um so we in ter in terms of fictionalizing her in terms of our version of belta costa green we had to surmise a lot and envision a lot. And, and a, that I feel like Victoria, don't you think like really came alive through our conversations? Conversations, Yeah. We wondered everything. We wondered what was the relation like with JP Morgan? Did they get involved? I mean, we talked it out as if we were, you know, their therapist or something. And, and right. they come and talked to us and told us we talked it out and then turned it into the book. Book, yeah. and, and so let, let, let me ask, I think, you know, to both of you, you guys' points, I mean, the book take wonderfully, you know, takes on so many contemporary issues, you yeah. know, from, you know, from race, gender, same sex, um, and interracial relationships, mm -hmm. um, and even issues around colorism that we still see, you know, mm -hmm. today. Um, did you have any idea that the, the historical kind of depiction would be so relevant today, or, or was that by design? Oh, I think that was by design, don't you? By think? design. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely like striking as it was as we were writing about it, what was actually happening in the world. I mean, I think we knew beforehand that it was a, both a historic and a modern story, but how very modern it was. I mean, I mean, we we were knee deep in edits and rewrites during the pandemic as black lives matters was evolving around us and so as we were talking every day as victoria said for hours every day we were working the book but also we were talking about the world and what was happening and it was like like those two were 
becoming one and the same. I, I, don't, I don't have to it, it, it's harder it, better than that. But you know, one of the first, I don't know if Maria will remember, I think it was the first conversation we had. We knew how much, well, Marie knew because she was still telling me about the book because um, we were talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and how if it had not been overturned by the Supreme Court, that we would have not had 100 years almost, it feels like it sometimes, of Jim Crow. Yeah. Um, we, would we had a small period of time to get it right. And that was one of the first conversations Marie and I had. So we, were, we knew we were going to write the story with that in mind, that that made that overturning of the Supreme Court affected Belle's life. Mm -hmm. That affected her mother and her father. Her mother, who I believe, was as much of an activist as her father in the beginning, as much as a woman could be at that time. Uh, and everything about that affected Belle's life and mm -hmm. what she was trying to avoid. And then, so that was our backdrop. Wouldn't you say, Marie, in the first, Absolutely. you know, the first draft but then when we were working on the next drafts and doing the editing and the world around us was changing um it was and all of our conversations made it their way into the book and that's what's amazing is you know as we're writing this this obviously it's a historic story and based it's fiction but it's based very much in a historical time period on a real person all those conversations that we're having about what's happening real time, you know, last year are working their way into the book one way or another, because the parallels are like, we're literally hitting us in the face. And, you know, right. Belle was in such a, a unique position because not only was she living with the legacy of that, of the failure of the promise of equality, right? You know, you had the end of the civil war in 1865, you had reconstruction, you had the civil rights act of 1875, which had it never been overturned would have, we would have never had segregation and the Jim Crow laws and nearly as Victoria said, a hundred years of, of stuff we're still unpacking and undoing. Um, she not only lived with the legacy of that, which is really what forced her to pass, but her father was knee deep in that movement. Her father was uh, Richard T. Greener, fa famous in his own right. The first black man to graduate from Harvard, um, an activist, um, one of the first, the University of South Carolina had been integrated for a short period of time during this, this heyday of equality post civil war. Her father was one of the, the few black professors at that time, he became a librarian. He became, he got a law degree. He became an activist and an orator on issues of equality with Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. So she was raised in a household where, where that was what was supposed to happen. And that's what, as Victoria said, her mother started out hoping for. I mean, this was a woman who grew up in this, this, this really unique free community of color um, in Washington, D.C. Um, her family had been free for generations. They had their, their very own unique fixed society um, that celebrated their heritage. And, um, and that's how she was raised. And because of the historical context and the changes, she, she had to sacrifice that. I have an audience question here specifically about Bill's father. Um, in your re in doing the research, do you know if Bill ever wrote to her father, um, and did he have any part in her life? Hmm. Well, okay. So we know that he had a major role in her life when in her first sixteen years. Yeah. Um, and and when I say a major role, not only um, in her life and influencing her love of art. And again, he was a librarian. She became yeah. a librarian, so a little bit must be in the DNA. But um, his activism, you know, as you were speaking, Marie, I was thinking, wow, they were the first Black Lives Matter people. Yeah. You know, they, they really were. Um, he and Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. So we know he had a major impact in the first 16 years mm -hmm. because that was when the fork in the road came for her. Mm -hmm. And so Marie, do you want to pick up on the second, and well, the next part of her life? Yeah, I mean, so they, what happened, um, 
for work reasons, her father, um, things were changing. Her father couldn't do the sort of work he'd wanted to do. He actually took a job um, as head of the Ulysses S. Grant Memorial Project in New York City. So the, her family, they had to leave the University of South Carolina when she was still, I think she was actually born in Washington, D.C. That's where she grew up until she was about eight or nine, I think. And then they moved to New York as a family. Um, and as the years progressed, it became clearer and clearer to her mother that the life that they were seeking, they weren't going to be able to have. Um, and that her mother bit by bit, because um, the, the children were fair enough for them and she was fair enough and really so was Richard T. Greener, to be honest, they were fair enough to pass as white. Um, they moved into a white neighborhood. The children started to go to schools that were white. Um, you know, this was at a time period when there was a big influx of Mediterranean immigrants that looked very much like their family members. And, um, and so Genevieve, um, Belle's mother started to realize, you know, as many mothers do, they want what's best and easiest for their children. Um, while she didn't want, I'm sure to leave behind the beliefs and the, the fight really that they both had been engaged in it, what the, the promise of equality wasn't going to happen right then, you know, that, that segregation was coming and she was in that fork, she was pushing her children towards a white life. And that was something that the, the father, Richard Greener, he could not tolerate. And so the parents split and um, Genevieve really took the children along with her on this white journey. And Richard left the family um, and he ended up in Russia. I mean, that's a whole other story with it's the Japanese like, well, family. Yeah. I mean, we so could go we, on we, we, could, we don't really know what that. the parent her father after that mm -hmm. but we write fiction yes so we surmise some things based on some facts mm -hmm. um and so we do show a relationship mm -hmm. so that that takes me you know to to you know let's dig into how you actually pieced bell together um you know i know again i, I can't imagine the amount of, of research that that went into it uh, you know to your point marie you know being that she burned um yeah. all of her all Thank of her you, letters. <laughs> right so you know kind of what how, how did you piece bill together and i think as i was speaking um with a, a colleague earlier you know i feel like there's a ton of historical information kind of around other titans of the day the andrew carnegie's and, and rockefeller and not so much jp morgan so kind of how did you piece him together and, 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 and specifically the dynamic between he and Bill? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start with that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, you start with that one. Um, well, there's a wonderful biography. Um, usually I start with the original source material because, you know, I write a lot. I, my mission is really to excavate historical women from the past. And so I've written many um, biographical historical fiction about about important um, women from the past. Um, and I always start with their letters and with their journals and day books and all that kind of stuff. Well, Belle very purposely destroyed most of that. And she actually instructed most of the people that she knew to destroy any letters she wrote them when when she died. Um, so what remained um, were business letters, um, you know, and, and correspondence, um, certainly accounts of her from contemporaries during that time period, um, newspaper articles and interviews about her from that time period, um, and a collection of letters that she wrote to a man who became really the love of her life, Bernard Berenson. She burned all of his letters to her and against her wishes, he kept them. Um, we, they are in the process of digitizing those letters. Um, right now they're actually in Italy, um, at his, uh, Palazzo. Um, and the biographer of a one who, um, Heidi Artizoni, who wrote an amazing biography of Belle, which, uh, you know, Victoria and I devoured called an illuminated life. She went to Italy and studied the letters. I was actually going to go to Italy um, last year. And then with the pandemic, I could not, I was actually going to go and examine the letters myself. So we really had to rely upon, um, and I, I know that Heidi spent a tremendous amount of time with the letters. Um, and that kind of filled in some of the pieces. So kind of, and, and where you, where we didn't know things from the original record 
we went into um, what I like to call not secondary sources, but kind of go around the, um, the original source material. So for example, we knew that um, Belle had grown up in um, this, this beautiful community of color in Washington, DC. So we researched that community and came to get a good sense of what their practices and rituals and, and what their houses looked like and all to, to fill in the gaps that were really left by the record. The same is true for Richard Greener, you know, um, and there have been biographies written of Richard Greener and he himself wrote 65 papers during his lifetime which I read. So the ones that still exist. So, you know, by kind of going around the subject, you can find a lot. Um, and another example would be with Bell's passing, you know, we don't know how she felt about it because even with the letters that she wrote to Bernard that still exist, she never talked about passing. She never admitted to him that she was black. So what Victoria and I did was do a lot of research around families um, that we do have accounts from, from that time period. There's a wonderful book by um, a historian, Alison Hobbs, called A Chosen Exile, which did a deep study of, um, of people from that time period who passed and what that looked like, how they had to leave their families of origin behind, the kind of sacrifices they made, the jobs they took, but you know what their lives looked like. And, and it was sort of those things that gave us, I think, a historical framework in the areas where we didn't have actual source material. Um, and of course, there's a lot of material about JP Morgan. So, you know, where, you know, for example, there might've been a period of time where she was serving as his personal librarian and we don't have Bell's day book, but we know she was his personal librarian and she was there every day and we knew what he did. So yeah. you could fill in the gaps that way. So, you know, where you don't have the, the, the material straight up, you can kind of go around the topic and, and fill it in in other ways. Yeah, I think one of the the, the most fascinating, um, you know, things as I read through the book was the injection of Marie. You've obviously written mystery mystery uh, novels and, and fiction, um, and Victoria, you know, seeing the glimpses of kind of the the romance in there, <laughs> and I think it was absolutely, um, you know, interesting and wonderfully done, uh, you know. But I, I must say, you know, as we as you read through, you know, I was on the edge of my seat, you know kind of thinking about, is it going to be revealed that, that she's passing or, you know, when, you know, when is this, you know, when is this going to happen? I think whether it's for literary we, effect we, or not. We oh, did, okay. One of the things we did know was that, that we found in articles and things was that people questioned her complexion. Mm -hmm. You know, her mother had prepared them for it with her middle name, but people were like, why is she look kind of black? <laughs> They didn't say, they were like, you know, the dusky complexioned exotic right. beauty, you know, all these right. euphemisms to kind of hint at the fact that she was different okay. in some way, okay. which her, as Victoria said, her mother, they added that name da Costa to suggest a Portuguese heritage. Should anyone raise an eyebrow, you know, um, but just, so, sorry, go ahead. no, you go ahead. I would just like, again, I think it, it just is even, you know, more interesting that I think part of it was a thrill. It, it ended up, you ended up seeing glimpses of part of it being a thrill for her, you know, to, to not get caught. So oh, I, yeah. I've gotten, I've gotten a million dollar question in the chat. Um, you know, did JP Morgan know she was, <laughs> know she was passing? <laughs> you want to take that one, Richard? Well, that's interesting. I mean, you may want to read the book to find out what we believe, what yeah. we think. Um, you know, because wouldn't that be interesting in real life? Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, it could have gone one of two ways. He was the most powerful man in America, more powerful than the president of the United States. Um, and so can you imagine if, because he thought he, we do believe this, when she walked in the door to become his personal librarian, he believed she was white. Mm -hmm. um, there were enough rumors, probably and from people around him, where he would have had to have heard something, right? So it could have gone one of two ways. He could have found out and destroyed her, mm -hmm. or he could have found out and said, you know what? She's white. And if J.P. Morgan said you were white, 
you were white, no matter <laughs> what you looked like. And at a certain point in time, she banked on that, you know, and she, she, I, I, I don't think, you know, Victoria and I kind of envisioned her as always kind of walking a tight rope, right? Even once he had kind of given her the stamp of approval, he was a very mercurial man and on a dime, could he have taken that away and, and, and changed his, his decision and changed her life? You know, I mean, I think you're alluding to the tension and that is something that, you know, we very purposefully put in there because the, 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 I I can't remember how you describe it, Victoria, but it's like, it's like a, this, um, this constant, um, not just tension, but it's almost like a weight that she's carrying day after day. When is going to be the day? Is today the day? Am I going to get away with it again today? Who's going to be the person that gives it up? Is it going to be something I say? Is it going to be, as Victoria always reminds me, it's not going to be the white people who can tell that she's black. It's going to be the black people who are in her presence. Is it going to be one of them? Is it, you know, white? It, this was an age of segregation. There wouldn't have been um, black people at their cocktail parties or visiting the library. Um, as a scholar, it would have been someone who was working in the home. Would it have been one of those people who were getting give her away? Would it have been somebody walking down the street? Would it have been somebody from an old part of her life? Yeah. Surfacing, you know, she was constantly um, walking on that tightrope and I cannot imagine what a burden that must have been and what just that kind of fear. Because, and especially in her past life, because remember she was six, when she became white, when she decided that her mother decided. So she had 16 years. There were people who knew her as Mm -hmm. black for 16 years. And she could have bumped into any one of them at any time. So you'll have to read the book to see. Exactly. It's tense. In your your research, I'm just curious, did, did you find out when it was revealed that she was passing? Was it after her death or after her death? It wasn't until, well, I don't want to give away too much because there could have been instances, but when it became known very publicly, um, wasn't until I think it was like the 1950s or sixties. There was a, it was after her death. She died in 1950. There was, um, I think it was like a scholarly article about yeah, her. They, then they connect her to her father. Yeah, that that was really the the number one thing she couldn't let happen. She couldn't let anyone know that she was Richard T. Greener's daughter because he was so definitively black, right? He was not just a black man. He was an activist for equality, firmly um, in the camp of all these well-known fighters for equality. So that was, and, and, you know, when you think about passing, you think about like, she had to excise, they had to excise from their lives, anyone who could give it up, family members, friends, people in the community. Um, and her father was, he was a well-known man. So that wasn't easy. Must've been scary. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, again, as you know, you read through and as, as again, as it masterfully kind of takes on, you know, takes on these issues, you know, I can't help but think that this, you know, the, the work was an intro to passing for maybe many re- readers to, you know, the practice of passing, yeah. um, not just the practice, but kind of the deep, you know, emotional weight that came along with it is kind of evidence with, you know, Genevieve and her family uh, those dynamics, um, it, you know, the book mentions, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and, and kind of this being the embodiment of that double consciousness. <laughs> and so I, I guess I just wonder, you know, if um, that was a dynamic you considered as, as you know, as, as you wrote this. Oh, yeah. No, I, knew, I, I said every night Belle went home. She took off the mask, laid her head on the pillow, and she was black. And um, somebody asked me about this in an interview, you know, because they said they felt that they felt her inner turmoil. They felt they felt her blackness inside of her as she was living as a white woman. And I was like, that was the easy part to write um, because there's a poem um, called "We Wear a Mask" uh, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and 
we we wear a mask. Well, I knew exactly what it was like for her to wear a mask. I knew it was exactly what I I've never passed, obviously, but I knew exactly what it was like for her to walk out into the world and to have to play a part. Uh, and so that was um, almost the I understood Belle a lot at that level. And Victoria, I mean, she trusted me enough, felt comfortable enough with me to talk to me about what that was like as, as a black woman in the modern world, you know, and that was a gift that she gave that a gift of trust that she gave me to talk to me about what that was like, because I, I don't know, I don't know what that's like. And that's, you know, I mean, and that was transformative for me as a person in the world, not just as a writer trying to make a character come alive um, and to see the world as Belle saw it, which of course these conversations were helpful for that. But I mean, for me, it just, it really changed the way I see the world and the lens through which I, I see the world. Um, and, you know, we hope that you know, I'm going to start tearing up again. I'm trying to like be my like professional self, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, to, to see Belle, you, you have to see the world through, I had to see the world through Victoria's eyes. Absolutely. Certainly an emotional, emotional book. Um, so I'm, I'm being flooded with questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into Q&A okay. 743. Um, so is, is Belle given the credit that's due to her in regards to establishing the library? It's becoming that way. Yes. They did not recognize her for many years. And before Marie and I um, started this book, we visited the Mor Morgan Library. Thank God we did it like oh my God. weeks really before the pandemic, not very uh, much time. And so we got a chance to walk through it and feel, and there were two references to Belle at that time, the bus and then in her office, which they recognized as her office, there was a mention of her. But Marie, when you used to go, there was no mention of her, right? It really wasn't. I learned about her from a docent. Yeah. Um, not from a, a plaque or a book or anything like that. I mean, it was really... It was really J.P. Morgan's library, and and of course now it's it's like a campus. I mean, there's the original beautiful library, and then they have like an interior garden and gallery halls because they have vast and immense holdings, which really extend far beyond the kind of original collection that J.P. and um, Bell created together. Um, but no, I don't think um, her role was whether it was not known to the extent that we understand it to be today or whether there wasn't the same commitment to sharing that i don't know what i will say is that victoria and i spent a lot of time there yesterday and um they're doing i, I mean i'm very pleased to say that there's going to be a huge commitment to it uh there's going to be a huge exhibit excuse me in two years um all about, it's the commemoration of its 100th anniversary as a public institution, which started in 1924, which Bell was hugely instrumental in making happen. Um, and we'll, you have to read the book to figure out why that was so important to her. But, um, and Bell is, the, it's about Bell, it's all about Bell. And um, I just could not be more delighted about that. I think it's really her role, her, um, the hand she had in all of it is is going to be abundantly clear. Um, in that we even that. gave them a, some suggestions. Yes, oh, we did. Pretty oh, decent awesome. suggestions. What they, they need to do to raise yes. Bell and how they need to put her office back together. Back together again. Because J.P. Morgan's office is together, so we want Bell's office to get together. Where's her office now? Oh well, it's, it's still there, but they yeah. it doesn't look the way like J.P. Exactly. Morgan's office exact. is exactly the way it looks. Exactly. Okay. So there's really three main rooms in the in the original building. His you walk in, you don't walk in this way anymore, but through this spectacular rotunda, through these bronze doors, it's so impressive. To the left is his office, which is if you go online, his study. If you go online, you can see it. It's spectacular Amazing. and then to across the hall is the library which 
honestly is one of the most beautiful libraries I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's hard to describe how gorgeous it is. And then in the center was Bell's office, which was spectacular. I mean, two stories, a, a, a fireplace you could walk in, books, and, and she had her own personally crafted um, desk there with all these secret compartments and, um, but it's now a gallery room for, um, the, the, the exterior of it is the same, like the walls and everything, but inside, instead of her desk and set up exactly as she had it, there's, um, an exhibit of ancient Mesopotamian seals, which I suppose are super cool. Like I like ancient stuff, but I would go with bells. Uh, and I think, I think they will do that. I really do. I think they are. I think at least for that, they will res restore her office. I hope so. And then we'll tell everybody it was because of us. <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were a little bit vocal about it yesterday with some of the Morgan folks. So I have a question from Deborah. Um, were either of you able to talk with people who personally knew Bill? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that, that's a, a bridge I cross a lot. Um, in writing about historical women, you know, Belle's family, uh, Belle didn't have children of her own. There's a long story about how she kind of adopted her, one of her sister's children, which we had in the book, took out of the book, um, but he did pass away. Um, her mother passed away. She had siblings that married and had children and we could have tracked them down. But, you know, this, I always at some point have to remind myself, ourselves, that we actually write fiction. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I, I think if I felt like someone who, who knew them was personally was, you know, during the time period in question was, was going to be able to shed a huge amount of light maybe, but, um, no, we did, we did not reach out, but I would be curious to know where her family is. And, you know, maybe we'll do that as part of our, of, of our kind of follow on, on, on Val. Awesome. Um, I have a question from Anonymous. Um, I hope you'll discuss her New York apartment and her sad headstone. So is, is there any of those, mm. any things that you came across? Yeah, the apartment, we, we, uh, she had a couple of them. So we talk yeah. about the New York apartment. In the book. I mean, I love talking about real estate. Yeah. Uh, and the headstone, I don't know. I mean, I do know she, I mean, I don't know if she has, are, are you, they talking about like, she doesn't have a grand monument like the Morgans do? I would, I mean, yeah, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, the Morgans have uh, like, it's yeah. mausoleums, they're statuary. It's, it's almost like, that book, yeah, that, right. And in fact, we do include that extensively in the book. Um, you know, in fact, there's almost like an, an Athenaeum in Connecticut that, um, JP built to honor his father. Um, and the notion of building something as a monument to um, the people that came before you is actually a very important part of the book because legacy, the kind of legacy that we leave is really important to Bell's father, really important to Bell. And it, that notion of legacy is really important um, in the story and the outcome of the story. But she did, I do think it's cool. The one thing that she did with her nicest apartment, um, she, you know, she lived with her mother her entire life. Belle never married, which is um, a really important part of the book. I don't know how much we should talk about that, but um, she, at different points in time, she was like supporting her whole family. I mean, it was kind of crazy, but um, and they had various family members living with them and brothers-in-law and stuff and, to, and nieces and nephews. But uh, the one constant was she always did have her mother live with her until until her mother died. But at one point, there were so many siblings, nieces, nephews, people around that she actually bought two apartments right next door to each other. And rather than combining them into one huge apartment, um, she just had one connecting door, like almost a connection between two hotel rooms, because it wasn't considered seemly for a single woman to live by herself during that time period. So this way it looked like she lived with her family, but she still had her own apartment and she could do her own thing and she didn't have to deal with their drama and all their stuff. So she was affluent enough to have two big apartments with connecting door that she built within walking distance of the Morgan library, which was, which was a beautiful neighborhood in it is today, but it was at that time as well. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I have a, a, a comment. Um, I'm a retired from Donna in the chat. I'm a retired librarian archivist. 
but only stumbled across Bella Costa Green about five years ago when I found a biography about her. Yeah. I hope the book raises her to the status that she merits. And I, I think, yeah, the, kind of leading to another question, you know, any ideas about kind of what's responsible from, you know, for her kind of being thrust out of obscurity into, you know, just the spotlight now? You're saying what started it or? Yeah, any, yeah, any thoughts around, yeah, kind of, you know, what's caused this? Um, because again, I think like, you know, many, like she mentioned, there are so many people who just never heard the story. Oh, why people are interested in, in her. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. She's really speaking. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, she was starting to come out little by little, but I do believe um, a lot of the things that happened last summer mm -hmm. have the whole country looking for, okay, let's let's find out some parts of our history. Mm -hmm. uh, while so many people are trying to suppress history, there most people really want to discover. And so I think because during last summer, the Morgan, didn't they make a couple of posts about mm -hmm. uh, Bell Marie? Didn't they do that? They did. I think they were, they, you know, I think as Victoria said, I think there's um, an interesting kind of looking at the past and looking at, at well, there's two sides of it, right? There's people who would prefer not to look at the past and people who are looking for um, role models from the past, people who've made a huge difference and who haven't gotten their, their due. And the Morgan, I think there, there were several posts um, starting last spring in through maybe the summer into the fall talking about how Belle really did deserve um, to have the light shined upon, shown, shown, shine. I, I don't know what the right word is. I should know whatever the right tense is upon her. Um, and, you know, as, as somebody who's, you know, been writing these books for, you know, six, seven years now, right. Looking at these issues for much longer before that it's so gratifying. It's so gratifying to see people wanting, thirsting to see women, people of color to see the voiceless get a voice. It is like, it's like a dream come true. And it, it's a battle, you know? I mean, a lot of people would prefer not to see it. it sometimes it's, it's hard work finding them because they were so marginalized and so suppressed and so voiceless. You know, record keeping, um, uh, you know, what only recently has it been considered appropriate or were, were women, people of color stories considered worthy of keeping and telling. So when you go back to find these people, there's nothing, there's no records, but any that's, I digress. That's like a personal mission and passion, but um, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely, I think a desire and an interest. And I think to, to think about the fact that somebody, um, a man, a white man who's so key in our nation's history from the 1800s into the early 1900s, he died in 1913, actually had a, a black woman at his side as his closest confidant, probably his closest true friend at the end of, at the end of his life. And who helped really, him amass, who right. helped him amass that collection. That collection. And more than that, I mean, she was really his sounding board for so many things at the end of his life. I think that really has to make us sit up and think. Sure. For sure. I mean, it's like, it's an amazing story. Um, before I get to the, the final question around um, what's next for the both of you um, together and individually, um, <laughs> you know, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to, to just talk about, you know, in, in your words, you know, we want everyone to read the book, of course. Um, but, you know, what, what is Belle's legacy? Mm. Ooh. Uh, I'll take this one first, uh, Marie. You know, I think she has a twofold legacy. And I'll let Marie really talk about, well, I, I don't know, what Marie, let Marie talk about what she wants to talk about, but about the legacy that she leaves with the Morgan Library. But what she had to do in order to accomplish what she did leaves us with some lessons and um, so uh, the study of her life, people reading her book. Today, I got so many emails from people who say, who, who were saying, I can't believe what she went through. Um, I can do what I need to do. Mm. And I think that's going to be a big part as people read this book. 
Uh, and I think one of the things that I love about this book is that people aren't blaming her for doing it and saying, oh, she didn't do anything. People feel like, okay, she's, she's left some footprints in the sand. She wasn't able to, to describe herself or claim herself or live authentically, but she did leave some footsteps for us to follow. Yeah. And um, I'm just so, I feel blessed that we were able to bring out her story. So people are seeing that part, not just the Morgan Library, which is very important, but she's left some personal messages for women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I just to add, to echo what beautiful uh, uh, Victoria just said so beautifully is that like, I would love to say that she was able to fulfill her full legacy during her lifetime, right? The legacy that her father dreamt about, you know, he wrote this amazing prescient paper in the 1800s called The White Problem, which recast um, racism as, you know, at that time period, racism was perceived as the problem of, was because of black people's flaws and failings, unbelievably, like just, boggles the mind. Um, and he recast it as a, as the white people's problem that the, the, the way that the white population looked at the black population as having inherent flaws was so wrong. And he, he had this beautiful manifesto about, you know, we should all be able to, you know, fulfill our destinies regardless of all of that. And then he went on to list this huge, um, like almost like a laundry list of these incredible black American figures who had done so much, had so many accomplishments and his daughter would have been at the top of that list if she had been able to claim her true identity during her lifetime. And I think, you know, now we can see that legacy and, and see all that she accomplished. It breaks my heart that she couldn't fulfill her full, her true legacy during her lifetime as her father would have dreamed. And I think they're, they're, I mean, Victoria and I speculate that that broke part of Belle's heart too. You know, that when she was at that fork in the road and she went with her mother, Genevieve, that um, she knew that was her father's dream. And, and then when she got to the end of her life and she had accomplished gosh, so much more than any other woman of her time period, black or white, right? She, I mean, what she did, she was the most powerful woman in the art world. And she, one of the most powerful people in the art world, she was the most successful career woman of her day. And she did all of that and she couldn't really even claim it fully, right? So I think that breaks my heart. I think it probably broke her heart. I think that that was a huge sacrifice that she had to live with that she couldn't um, fulfill that part of her legacy. Although we can see it today, you know, and I, and I am glad about that. She certainly had, I think a, a big legacy during her lifetime. You know, she, she left the world an amazing institution, the Morgan library. It's a world-class collection that has shaped scholarship around the world. It is open to the public only because of Belle. She convinced the Morgan family to make it public. I think we think that that was, it had, that this was the way she made her sacrifice worthwhile to leave an important legacy. If she was not gonna be able to fulfill her father's hopes and dreams for her, she had to make it worth it. And making that, that library, that world-class institution, a public institution open for everybody, everywhere, maybe in some way made it, made it worth it for her. Um, and she just revolutionized libraries in, in general. She cr basically created touring exhibits. She created um, sharing of collections, uh, all sorts of things that are pretty common today. She was really at the forefront of. So there's so much that, that we really are indebted to um, for Belle Costa Green, but it's very, I think very bittersweet. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. I, we are, I hate, we have to stop here, here. Um, but I wanted to, again, give you, you guys an opportunity to, to talk to me about what's next um, for each of you. Okay, so we went out individual and then we talked about, yeah, okay, absolutely. 
um, individually, I write very different kinds of books <laughs> normally. And right now I'm working on. Well, we lost you, Victoria. Oh no. Oh no, I'm here. Oh, she's, oh, she's here, okay. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened. I was just talking. Can you hear me? We can yes. hear you, but you're a little bit frozen. So, um, I was, I was, um, I'm working on the Seven Deadly Sin series. So lust, envy, greed, wrath, pride, and I'm currently um, work writing pride. But what's so exciting is that two of them have been made into movies. And in fact, the encore presentations are coming on tomorrow night on Lifetime. Oh, hey. so Wonderful. If anybody wants to watch Less Than Envy, it'll be, on, it'll be on Lifetime tomorrow night. Good timing. I know. That's awesome. Absolutely. And so um, oh yeah, I have um I continue to write books about um incredible historic women. I have a book coming out next January called Her Hidden Genius which is about Rosalind Franklin, who was a brilliant British scientist in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, who actually through her hard work and ingenuity um, was the one who discovered the double helix structure of DNA. Um, but without her knowledge and certainly without her permission, um, one of her colleagues took her data and her discoveries and shared it with two scientists that you may know um, better, uh, Francis Crick and James Watson. And Crick and Watson won the um, Nobel Prize for the discovery of uh, the structure of DNA. So it's um, a deep look at, at, a, at a, an incredible life um, and an incredible series of contributions by uh, Rosalind Franklin, but also the way in which um, women scientists were not just marginalized, but very often intentionally, um, their contributions were intentionally suppressed or taken. Um, and the way in which that, you know, that legacy really continues on today. And then Marie and I will be writing another book together. And I always say, I love to say it this way because I want people to see them as friends. It's about Eleanor and Mary. Yes. I always love to say that. that. Way. Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune. And Marie, do you want to say what we're, they, they have an amazing friendship. They do. So they, what we're going to talk about is, um, the way in which these two women really crossed the divide, a huge divide that separated them um, and came together sometimes very overtly, sometimes kind of behind the scenes to a really effectuate great change in the area of civil rights specifically, but also the way in which um, coming together, having awkward conversations, making mistakes, coming to understand one another and have really hard difficult um, discussions about, you know, ourselves and our world and uh, racial attitudes are what allowed them to kind of um, forge that friendship very much like Victoria and I have done. And how important that is for, I think, all of us to do. That's absolutely wonderful. Right. We're excited about that. Yeah, we're really excited. It's like, I, I don't want to call it an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would, could, I mean, could I be Eleanor Roosevelt? How cool would that be? But no, that's not. And I, I could be Mary McLeod Bethune. I wouldn't mind that either. Right. <laughs> well, you're both wonderful. Um, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to chat with you about the book. Um, it's phenomenal. Um, and congratulations um, on everything mm -hmm. on the release. And I can't wait for the world to continue to read it. And thank you. Just thank you for the time tonight. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, Marie and Victoria, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. And I was basically jumping up and down when I heard that you both are writing another book together. So please put yeah. the History Center on your list um, to come back by oh, here um, when in a couple of years when, it, when it's done. So thank, thank you both again to everyone in the audience. Thank you for attending the book as the personal librarian is by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. You can purchase it from our official bookseller, Foxtail Bookshop, located up in Woodstock. There's a link to do that in your chat. 
And if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, we have lots more coming up and including one in-person event, which I'm really excited about. So our next virtual event is next week. We're welcoming Dr. Rebecca Tosig to discuss her book, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body. It's a memoir and essays. It's absolutely fabulous. So I'm very excited to be welcoming her virtually next week um, on July 8th at 7 p.m. And you can find a link to register for that one in the chat. And then we're welcoming um, uh, novelist Vanessa Riley later this month in person, which is super exciting. She's local to Atlanta. Um, and this is her first historical fiction novel. So if you like undertold stories about incredible women, you will really like her book, Island Queen. So she's that's wonderful. A she's a wonderful person. Good, wonderful speaker too. Yeah, I was just absolutely thrilled when her publicist contacted us. So I'm so excited. You can find the uh, information to register for that event um, also in the chat. So again, uh, Marie, Victoria, Chris, thank you all so much. And to our audience, I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Marie. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye.